we're going to do this a little bit differently than a lot of the other live streams I've seen uh, done by just people in this scene or like producers in general. Yeah, shout out to you for real. Um, I want something more in depth because the problem I had with a lot of other producers and artists when they broke down their songs was they would give kind of like a cursory overlook of the audio files and just be like, oh yeah, I dragged this in. It was a sample or like the most annoying one was always, oh yeah, I made this in a separate sound design session. And it's like, dude, show me how you made the sound itself, but they never would. And you know, I can understand it. Sometimes artists just don't want to give away their secrets or they understand that the majority of their audience doesn't care, but I want people to like watch this and then be able to go back into their DAW and apply techniques or things they've learned. Like I want this to be practical. Hi Gwen, hi Wisp, hi Quadrinol, hi USB. Hi Corefish, oh my God. Yeah, apologies, it takes forever to load. Um, CPU might be an issue, but hopefully not. Hi Java, sorry, okay, I can't name everyone. Hi Glitchless. It happens. All right, here we go. So I'm just gonna go and do like a, oh yeah, there, that probably looked oh, underwhelming, but a lot of this is in stacks. Here we go. Yeah, so this was about, I would say, 300 or 400 tracks uh, before I did a lot of the organizing and just resampling things to audio. Right now, it's about, what was that, 183? So, not huge. I wanted there to be more something I'm working on an extra song and more and more songs just like adding layers but I'm just gonna go through explain the techniques for things if it's sound design related explain the mixing if it's just something I recorded and at the end you guys can like ask specific questions if I went over anything or just want more like detailed answers oh yeah okay let's probably ask do you guys want me to start from the top or just like go through individual sections based on what people want. From the top, all right. There is, okay, there is a command on Mac. Let's get this shit to go away, but there we go, okay. I'm not going to go full screen because I, all right, I'm going to have the chat pulled up on my phone because that was a problem with previous live streams I've done. I always missed out on what people were saying and I feel bad about that. All right. So. Yeah, in total, this is probably only going to be around an hour, like not. Yeah, in a systematic way. I don't want to be like over the top in depth because a lot of this information is just extraneous, but I want people to know, I want people to like figure out how they can make every sound. Like watch this, t take notes if you want to and like steal from me, literally like take my techniques because I would have saved like years probably. It's not even an exaggeration. If I knew stuff like this, obviously I can't contain it all within a 45 minute live stream. But this would have saved me so much time and effort if I could have known, like, just how to sound design. And no one taught me, so I had to just, like, scrounge around on the internet and ask people directly and a lot of just trial and error. But I will stop the, the forward. I know that's really annoying by now. So, also ignore the file names. I was on something, probably. So we don't get mic bleed. Okay. Oh, 
Good Lord. Yeah, so this stuff up here. Why is there no output on this one? So a lot of this stuff is taking harmonic pieces of information, like whether it just be uh, something resampled from like an instrument, cello, guitar, what have you, even vocals, uh, bells is something I use quite a lot. It's super loud on stream. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. I'm sorry. Thank you. I knew that was going to be a problem. I forgot to check. Okay. Thank you so much for letting me know. Let's test the levels. Better? I am so sorry for destroying everyone's speakers. Audio input capture should be... It's still loud. I, dude, I have it turned down, like, to negative 60... To, like, literally negative 68.9 dB. Okay. It's probably an issue native to logic. I don't put capture. Let's see if I can just on that quite a bit. I don't still clipping a lot. Did you increase the volume? Oh god, now we have another technical issue. I'm terribly sorry for this. I'm expecting it to still sound like uh, military bombing. Are we, are we any better? The uh, volume from Logic is turned way down. Much better? Okay. Are we good? So, like, mic and stream levels are balanced. Still kind of loud? Oh, fuck. Better? good enough oh, okay we don't it doesn't need to be good enough we can make this perfect i all right let's see this because it's over here we're good a bit up by like two decibels all right are you better Okay, so, everything out of the way, I'll just get to this. Thanks for sticking with me through not knowing how to operate OBS. Okay, that is a music box playing, I believe, some inversion of a major seventh chord. Uh, and then stretched, pitched up, and reversed. Yeah, so this is just a normal, normal last like riser I took. Probably pitched down somewhat. Yeah, I know I haven't graphed the tab. I had not graphed the tabs. I'm sorry, USB. <laughs> I need to get to that. It's just, it's going to take forever. Maybe after this. But yeah, I did an absurd amount of uh, low-end boosting. But since it's in the chain where a lot of it is already being limited, it's not necessarily to a point where it's just destroying the whole master. It just adds like a subtle bit of warmth uh, because there's already like vinyl processing on it. I know it looks ridiculous, but it is achieving a purpose, especially because there's overdrive afterward. I, I wanted this whole section to feel really analog and rem reminiscent of the work Quadica, Quadeca did for um, quite a bit of his stuff on I Didn't Mean to Haunt You, like the interludes. Yeah, so this is also a music box with pretty normal ass tape processing limiter overdrive the thing that's giving it that weird kind of 16th note gate is phase lock without it it's
definitely some uh, resampling with just stretching, pitching, messing it around there. Uh, but the, but the, okay, so the phase lock is part of this sample, not sample pack, this plugin pack by Stepwise, uh, and it's got bin scrambler, bin scrambler, frequency magnet. Spectral gate. It's a lot of spectral stuff uh, that rearranges the phase of waveforms. So you get so many weird, interesting textures just with those plugins alone, applying them to things. Same thing uh, with the bells. Brought them back here. Uh, the no, I think okay. I think this was a marimba I played in just MIDI, um, and extreme stretching is something I abuse. It's it's almost like how other producers just throw OTT on things, which I do plenty of. I will stretch things and repitch things uh, to a point where they're just not really recognizable as their original selves. Added added it a bit here. This is another technique. I abuse where it's like okay so you have the main the main audio just chopped up and then it goes up like what it goes up an octave for like up not even half a second uh just as a little texture and that's the, so many of this stuff is things you would not notice that I, I wouldn't notice if I wasn't looking at the project file um, and I know uh, so many artists talk about it where it's just adding details that don't really need to be there. It can be a problem, but I think to a certain extent, it also just adds like character to a song and it can be really important if you want to make something memorable and stand out. You know, you, you obviously don't need an absurd amount of details, but just little bits of ear candy, little background synths and fills that make the listener kind of, uh, it grabs their attention. What the hell is that? What the hell is that? Okay, that I'm pretty sure was analog. It was an okay, so it was an analog waveform. Uh, I've had this. I've had this same thing. I've worked on for quite a bit. It's just like a vital preset, but uh, same thing with repitching and stretching. It's, it's just triangle waves. It's triangle waves with some uh, really strange, like kind of pitch warble and the whole analog processing but it's it's triangle waves and then the main thing that i did that i've applied to so much here is this one trick i found last year over the summer so i'm sure we're all familiar with like little alter boy right great plugin for just repitching stretching ignore the names ignore the names someone else I'll answer questions later, by the way. Sorry if I'm skipping over those. Um, this is really helpful for just vocals and pitching up, I think, drums especially. It can add some weird transient artifacts. But the main thing is it's only supposed to be used on a mono signal, right? Monophotic voice manipulation. So when you apply it to something stereo, you just get all of these weird textures. And it doesn't really quite... So, if yeah, if you apply it to, like, something stereo and monophonic... Meaning, so something that isn't monophonic, meaning like multiple voices, like a chord, uh, you just get so many weird textures and artifacts to a point where it's kind of indistinguishable uh, from the original. And this was the same thing, but I think the problem was I, I just did it so many times, like so much post-processing -pro using that method that, plus the, art the artifacts with the repitching and shifting, it just got this. I know that sounds like tremolo automation and you know it it should be it really should be but what happens when you're just sound design when you just sound design so much and just keep like resampling pieces of audio is they they become something that you never could have anticipated and just it'll get like the effect of a phaser or the effect of a 
tremolo or a filter or something without you ever having applied those plugins. This is the weird thing. Um, yeah. So that about covers it for these textures at the start. Again, again, same technique, repitching, little author boy pitching up. Uh, but these, I believe, the bass signal instead of being uh, bells or um, instead of being like a music box or a triangle waveform like it was for the others, these are actually. Um, church bells that I took and like added resonances to them and then arranged them in a chord and it sounds so it sounds so weird it got again the artifact like this here where it kind of gets a piece of melody and there's these uh there's these underlying like low end artifacts that come with it. That's just because of Little Alter Boy. Okay, this is Foley. I add so much Foley to things. Uh, specifically, like this loop, these bells. Uh, this is another thing I use a lot, just church bells. Uh, also chimes. A bit of high end. I'm going to keep up the VOD, yeah, for quite a while. Uh, okay, so the guitar. Sorry, I'm, I'm, let me know if I'm taking things too slow or too fast. I'm trying to just keep a good tempo. And also, yeah, obviously, if the mic it, levels are off or whatever. So this is a guitar. Uh... It's just pitched up, chopped up, obviously, and a lot of effects. Okay, so, well, obviously, throughout the uh, whole section here, there's quite a bit of automation. We have frequency shifting that's just taking things up. Weird, weird thing about frequency shifting is uh, if you go below, I believe, around 500 hertz downwards, um, the sound itself starts to, you get a, you get aliasing quick rundown of aliasing is basically when you produce a signal within your DAW that it can't process. Uh, so it kind of encodes it back up to a higher or lower octave, uh, within the sample rate you've chosen generally, you know, 48 kilohertz, whatever. So that's what's happening here. Like, it's just, it's going so far below the, like, area where my computer can process it. It just maps back up. So it kind of just drops out in volume. Now, it's not just my computer, obviously. It's just how audio processing works. There's a bit of low-cut automation there. Nothing too special, just, um... Something I use... A lot of producers use where you just kind of have the intro like slowly fade out and like whether it be high cut or low cut to kind of add emphasis to the section that follows it what is this oh this is just pan so that's pretty self-explanatory if you're not a I expect most people here are producers, but if you're not, if you're just like liked the song, I'll, I'll try and make it approachable for that. Panning just means taking an audio signal and making it go left or right. So the thing about this guitar is like, it's not, it's got so much weird processing on it. Main thing I would say is form and shifting because it's got chorus, phaser, obviously vinyl processing, like everything else. Which makes it sound pretty weird, but predominantly it's that same trick. It's just pitching it up 12 semitones on a monophonic, uh, pitching it up 12 semitones on a polyphonic signal 
uh, and then you just get these weird artifacts. It's kind of being detuned slightly. This thing was fun to make. So, hi, Lazarin. Let me know if I get anyone's names. That's wrong. Yeah, so this is the guitar, but distorted and pitched up. Yeah, okay. So what I did was I took this, I took a segment of the guitar, pitched it up 36 semitones, and I used the splice method in Logic, I believe, which instead of just pitching things up or down, like uh, how you would expect a algorithm to work like that, it rearranges it granularly when it pitches it up. And then if you stretch that, you get a lot of transients. Uh, and then from there, it was just the same processing that's applied to it on the rack and frequency shifting, like it was going up or down. Without any processing, it's just this. It just sounds like a guitar being pitched up and down. Oh, and then I also added, um, I also added uh, envelope which is a plugin in Logic. You can get it in most Oz. It's just, it's just a transient shaper. It just uh, adds a bit of attack. There's more over there. Uh, if you're tapped in, you can probably tell that was almost directly stolen from uh, drank 32 packet of your craft beers your parents out that one the intro to, to punk 2 here's my tag um sample from gen 6 anime pokemon thing more folly uh these are just wind chimes obviously in key with the song just serves as more texture And then this is the same. This is this, just pitched down at a really quiet level. So it's not even worth playing. Right. Uh, and then we have just brought back a lot of those audio files. Added a little bit of variation with repitching, whatever. I still have some of the Foley uh, going over the main guitar for the song. We finish the intro. Any questions so far? Yeah, we are still in the intro. I'm sorry, I'm taking things slowly. It it's gonna get faster as we go along, but yeah, I just want to make sure people understand. This is the GUI select from Pokemon Diamond, right? And I had pitched it down here. Yeah, so this is that same sound effect just with lossy going over it so at, at like 100 percent it's pretty much not audible Let me turn the game up a little background detail again and then it does come back here same thing with the volley but that's pretty much all this folder all this folder is um More bell, more of like chimes here. So the main body of the song is just this obviously acoustic guitar, but there's a ton of layers. And the processing for them is relatively simple. Uh, it's a bit more on. I mean, wait, there's really not. Yeah, so on the main body of it, I, I just have a compressor uh, with a pretty high ratio very slow attack uh, going throughout the whole thing and then cutting things below 40 hertz a, a lot of a lot of EQ automation uh, throughout the whole thing especially for the 
chorus section because I was just encountering issues with it. Yeah, if you if you see here, all all these little like kind of opaque lines in the background. All of this. You see all these parameters? There's automation on everything here. At least most of it. Uh, and that's that was just to keep it consistent throughout the whole track. <coughs> I also think I did a bit of DSing on the guitars themselves. Like there were moments where there'd be a really annoying peak around like 10k hertz and I would have to go in and manually lower that. I don't even know which parameter that was set to, but it's this little it's these little purple ones here. Layers, same thing, uh, cutting out a lot of the body of the sound, like around uh, 200 hertz, just to make room for the vocals. Obviously all the low end too. Uh, only thing that's applied individually is on quite a few of them, I would just make small changes like cutting out way more lows or cutting out a ton of the highs because that's the thing when you're layering, when you're layering instruments or just making songs in general, I think people overestimate the amount of high end you actually need. Uh, something called the 7K trick where it's like, unless it's a vocal or a hi-hat or like something you want to be noticeable and like the lead of your song, you can cut off things above 7K Hertz because that's just going to give you extra headroom and make the song sound less abrasive, just warmer. <laughs> But yeah, it's just EQ and compression. That's... Let's see... I'm trying to think of anything interesting sound design-wise I did, but these are really just guitars. Something I did do was I took the melody and just layered it with itself above an octave. Same thing with uh, cutting out the highs just to make it slightly more prominent in the mix. Press the arrow under the track name, it shows. If you press the arrow under the track name in automation view, it shows all of them. Yeah, I figured it wasn't that interesting, but I mean, here they all are, I guess. Too much. Just too much. Looking back on it, I did not need to do this much, but it kind of worked out. Uh, the only other thing I have c consistently going throughout like the acoustic folk part of the song is this triangle pad. It's boring, but it's just a vital... Okay, good. Uh, obviously just a triangle, not any other processing. Same thing with the vinyl rack, and my vinyl rack is just tape. Tape delay in Logic, uh, but weird thing about it is I, I use it in a very unconventional way, where it's like normally it's just a delay plugin, but it adds a bit of tape color and saturation, uh, and I just turn off the delay entirely, but have it at like 50% wet and just gives you a nice analog feeling saturation vinyl for like the kind of pitch warble effect isotope vinyl by the way free plugin and gigahertz lossy just going in and out ramping up and down throughout the whole track and then during the chorus section it's just playing all the way through okay this is a piano. Comes around a few times here. This is lossy hell. Yeah. <laughs> it works in the background. Uh, just pitch down one semitone so it fits with the new key and This is just more weird stretching and chopping 
Ooh. and obviously lossy at a high amount. This is also the piano, I'm assuming, as a background layer to add emphasis to that one note. No one's gonna notice that, but... Again, it the, uh, to call attention back to the notion of uh, background details, it's less about noticing them and more about what they add to the most prominent sound. Like, you can add a, a textural percussion loop underneath drums and people might not necessarily notice the percussion loop if it's at a really low level but it'll slightly alter the transients of the drums to a point where like people aren't thinking oh that's drums with a percussion loop they're just thinking oh those are really idiosyncratic sounding drums so that's my philosophy with layers again just the piano if you're wondering how i got it it's not a normal piano it's just the same method repitching Little Alter Boy, uh, 12 semitones up. Vocals. Okay, right before we get to vocals, I'll just take questions for a bit. Also, ignore my YouTube channel. I, I did a lot of this stuff when I was younger. And it was just kind of piano covers, but I want to uh, delete those and start something proper. Catch up on messages. All right, well, I guess we'll just keep going. Vocals are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, Colin was asking me about my processing rack earlier today, and that made me realize, like, how little I actually process vocals like there is pretty much nothing on these guys just mid EQ boosting around 300 270 Hertz to give the sound more like bass not not bass more like more like boominess just so it feels present and warm uh, and then it's taking that away on the sides uh, Mid-side EQ, cool technique if you didn't know it. Uh, you can control the stereo and mono components of your signal separately. Which is helpful if you're like bad bad at mixing or recording. She's never felt you can just apply it whenever. <laughs> so wrong, up in flames, your favorite ever in green. I think generally, generally it's one of those things where you don't necessarily need to apply it to all signals, but it can be helpful. Anyway, yeah, the only thing I do with vocals is just, I limit them all. To, uh, okay, so like, time editing, pitch editing within Logic, which is like the most draining and technical annoying process ever. But once it's finished, I just put a limiter on it. Uh that generally just looks like negative point zero point one output level obviously so it doesn't clip and then i put the gain to like 11 db uh just because i want the vocals to be consistent throughout the whole track Hawthorne the star was in crying There was just smoke in my eyes Holding you until the morning But falling in and out of the fire Breathed in hollow ivory Christian Carlos Bedard That shouldn't- that should have been panned Negative 32 for the official release. That is that is an error. But yeah, uh, when I do vocals, obviously it's a chord, but I try and, especially in the songs I'm working on now, this one's older, uh, same thing for like my method for recording harmonies on guitars and vocals. The harmony itself is important. Just think about like the music theory aspect, whether, whether or not the chord fits, which is a whole different discussion. But... I think about it a lot in terms of like 
harmonic content, like the frequency space, I want to fill up with those vocals. Like, obviously, this stuff is more around 250 hertz. Uh, but then when I add the falsettos, I just try and... That's based more around like 500 is where the fundamental is. And then sometimes I'll layer an octave down, but you don't want to have things clash. And ideally, you want it to sound full. Like you're, you're utilizing all the space and all the headroom you have. Uh, only bit of automation on these vocals really is that they come back during the, obviously the post punk rock outro, whatever, with an absurd amount of OTT on them. I think I ought, must have automated the OTT on them individually to like at least a hundred percent. Maybe not that much, but. I wanted them to just be slammed. Not quite. Where's the bypass for OTT? Threshold, upward strength, def. What? Why isn't it there? You might have been some issue with resampling things, but point is, I just, I absolutely cranked the OTT on the lead vocals for the outro, probably to around 70, which I know is not professional. People tell you not to do that. But I just needed them to be completely flat since that section is just so loud. There's no dynamics. Like I wanted no differences in loud or quiet, like at all. They need to maintain like just complete dynamic uh, similarity. Anyway. Little guitar fill. This guy is different processing than the rest slightly. Like it's more of a more of a chunk taken out of a 350 hertz to make room for the piano. Uh well, that's it. Okay. That's our first CPU issue. Hopefully it doesn't happen again. Uh more chimes here. But yeah, that's the guitar and vocals, so that's like the, that's the body of the track. Oh, wait. Guitar for the outro. Probably cover that. So... In this section. Uh, I, there's a bit... There's even less post-processing on these guys because they're electric. I just took out a little around 2K. Uh, that's phase lock automation. The plugin I mentioned in the beginning is coming in slightly. Just adding some 16th note gate and also pitch pitch warble there and lossy as well just fades out okay so I took the power cord uh, actually all these cords and I threw them into a granulizer and I believe I lowered the grain size yeah I scrolled through the position parameter, but I just lowered the grain size, so it gets kind of like this tremolo effect, but I raised the grain length uh, concomitantly, so it's tremolo effect where it's just really fast and then gradually slows down, uh, but the audio file itself that it's using to do that is becoming longer throughout the whole thing, so it's like it's stretching. Almost. Yeah. It's effect. That's an effect I've seen Jane use a lot in her breakdowns. Shout out to Jane, by the way. Amplitude. Okay. So it's it's lazy. 
uh, I could have done this better. It's definitely just uh, like <laughs> not wanting to process them because they just sounded good enough. But the only thing applied to a lot of these guitars is just this preset from uh, Amplitude. Just a standard guitar amp. Uh, I think the plugin itself is free. You can um, purchase additional amps with upgraded versions, but comes with a lot. It's pretty solid just off the get-go. Uh, the main thing that's adding all these artifacts is like OTT on the guitar stack themselves. So whenever I stop playing a note or uh, hit the bridge of the guitar or whatever, there's quite a bit of just this artifact tail. Uh, this was me stretching the, the tails of these two takes with the splice mode. I don't know if anyone noticed that, but it's just a weird, weird way for it to trail off because it's a very unnatural sound, like, electric guitars do not do that. Same thing here, except I think I applied frequency shifting. No, that, that was to the other one. Yeah, this guy. Just meant to go up and down. And for the rest of the guitars, here are the chords. There is there is a bit of EQ. Like I think I added. I, okay, I, I, it, main thing is I just took away around like 3k hertz, 2k hertz, because that's where a lot of the electric guitar buzz is, and then I added some like high end above 6k. This is what the EQ curve looks like. Same thing with the acoustic guitars, a lot of automation on the EQ, but it's boring and highly specific to this song, so not really worth going over. But I did have to tailor these carefully so they fit with the vocals. There's going to be some CPU issues. Best thing for that generally is to turn off other tracks. But I don't think it's going to be that big of a problem. And these guys that come in are clean, obviously. So... was very inspired by the work of a lot of Midwest emo bands. Here, there's the tale of it looping over and over again, and this bit. Which is just a normal guitar with lossy automation. Again, it's just a matter of like taking the tail of a sound and manipulating it in a way where the actual instrument would never be able to replicate. So it still has a touch of like the, the organic natural quality, but at the same time, it's kind of distorted in this digital manner. That's something I tried to do with this song and just my approach to music in general is just blending, blending digital with like actual instruments and what we have in this in this world anyway I'm gonna take some questions since we're now gonna get into the um, sound design portion I guess so I'll look at what you guys have been saying underscores dryland outro yeah super inspired by underscores his work do you separate takes for all the harmonies or just most yeah generally I do a couple takes for a harmony and then just pick the best one and splice them together. The violins, yeah, I'll get to those. I'm scrolling up. 
to use a reference for frequency levels. What do you use as a reference for frequency levels of the guitar? Do you mean like just in in like mixing in that type of context? Frequency levels. Generally, those are two different things. I need, you need, okay, Drama Trial says I need the chord breakdown to that transition. Yes, you guys have been saying something about the harmonies. Yeah, okay. I, I'll get to the harmonies in a bit. How did you record the guitars? Uh, I have a Focus right, just Scarlet 4i4 uh, XLR cable into AT2020X. And that's for electric, for acoustic, obviously, the mic. How long did the intro take you to make? I think the majority of that done, well, the majority of that was done within like a five hour period from like midnight to 5 a.m. Maybe it was six. Is there a lyric break? To, I, I could explain the lyrics if you guys want. I don't know which frequencies the guitar should fill. It's kind of just by by ear, but I can it a lot of it's just kind of basic intuitive stuff like okay, I need a power chord to fill out like 200 hertz and then I need a melody uh for something to catch the listener's ear and it's memorable. Let's see. She said, "Do you use a DI box?" No, I do not. It's just direct input into the interface. I, I wait. I'm oh, sorry, I read that wrong. Yeah, it's just direct input. Um, I don't have like amps or any anything. I have been producing for around three years, but yeah, Laurel. So we can tackle the sound design or do you... Okay, would, would you guys want me to like go into the sound design, like all the fills, everything I did just on the computer, or should I explain like the harmony? Oh, also... I know this is something a lot of people are asking about. These strings are just contact Stradivari, cello and uh, violin. They have like tremolo presets. They have trill stuff. It sounds really natural. Great library. And then the piano is it's just on piano. It's called claustrophobic piano, just on piano book, uh, free plugin. It's like labs, but there's quite a bit more pedal noise and key noise, which is why I like to use it. It just sounds more, more like intimate. The harmony on that part. Okay, people have said harmony and sound design. All right, I'm going to go with the harmony since just, just for kind of like the sake of continuity. Okay. So... Hmm. I'm just worried because if you don't know music theory, it might be kind of hard for people to understand. And I, obviously, no shade to you if you don't understand it. it. There's a lot of intricacies, but I'm just I want people to like know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'll see if I can explain it simply. Okay. All right, so here we're on the four, which is the subdominant of the song, just a major seventh. The song's progression, of course, is just just walking down, really, from the tonic to the subdominant. Uh, just since we're in B flat here, I think that's E flat major seventh, yeah. So we go from E flat major to E flat minor. Uh, okay, you know what? Fuck this. Fuck this. Hold on. Hold on. All right. Lighting is terrible. I know I need a better webcam, but how's the piano? Good. 
Good. Okay. Hi, Josh. Yeah. All right. So for this section, we're on E flat, right? So what I'm doing here is just taking sixths and taking them up and down by a whole step or a half step on the violin, which is obviously just a trill. And then it's called common tone modulation, where E flat and E flat minor, which is the chords I'm moving in between, are obviously like really far away from each other in the circle of fifths, but it works because the notes themselves just completely detached from like the chord functions uh, work independently. So it's just a simple movement from E flat major ninth to E flat minor seven. There's a nine in there too. Here we go to a D nine, a, a D six nine. So That's going from a D6-9 to a C-sharp over F. And it works because the whole thing really has just been kind of in a pattern of going down by semitones, right? Like we went from E major 7th, E minor 7th, D back to C. So it's just, it's just going down, really, you can think about it. But what I'm doing here is it's a slash chord. So instead of playing the C sharp, like over the tonic, over, you know, the root of the chord, I'm playing it over the third. So it has kind of a more, it's insubstantial, like, ephemeral quality to it. Like it's tense, it's not quite resolved. And then since we're already on an F, I use that just, we're, we're already on like a, a C sharp over F, I just use that to go to F. So it's just a natural transition. And then we move down a whole step back to E flat, and that's the thing. It's like we're actually still in B flat. We never went anywhere, but... That's that's the trend. That's the transition period. It's like I wanted the effect of a key change without actually changing keys because in, if I had to change keys, I would have to re-record all the vocals, and I just felt like B flat was already a, a good center point for the song. But yeah, E flat major seventh, E flat minor seventh, D six nine. C sharp over F, F, six, F6, that's important. So, there's another section with kind of like weird chords. Should we go through that, or are you guys happy with just this? Thank you. All right. The, the pull the needle through area? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we're just 
and C here, right? And we've just been going, kind of pedaling around this, uh, we've, we've been keeping just this major third. No, yeah, this major sixth consistent throughout every chord. So we kind of go, instead of that, we have a fourth, which just makes it a major sixth. Sorry, uh, major seventh, my bad. Which is a lot more ambiguous, same quality I mentioned before with the other chord, C sharp over F, which lets us transition to D6, 9, again, same chord, it's a similar chord. Yeah, it's the same one I hit earlier, so there's, there's this underlying continuity throughout all the chords in the song that I tried to maintain, but... That's the common tone modulation, right? So, C, just on their own. If you were just in the key of C and you tried to move from C to D, it works, but it can sound a little bit jarring. And that's why having the E and the B, right? Just the, uh, the major seventh chord. You keep those notes the same when you move to the D6-9. So that's the common that's the common tone modulation again. The chords are far away from each other on the circle of fifths when you're talking about the qualities of the chord themselves, but when you're just thinking about the notes on a conceptual level, they're very close, which allows you to move in between them a lot more fluidly. So I have this upper structure right here, which is just a fourth. But I move that to a uh, to a B triad, third inversion, right? And then that lets me transition really easily, since we're already we're kind of already in D here to A. A is close to D. It's only a fifth. It's only a fifth down on the circle of it, or fourth, my bad. Because we're going we're going downwards here. moving in between these two guys right which is the a the b over a and then the uh, a flat minor seventh they have notes in common and what i went from so i from there i went to the chromatic mediant, which is uh, F. It's that same thing where the notes, the only thing tying the notes together is that the fact that they're only, it's only like a semitone away to move. So that, that's that the main theme here, and the main thing to take from this is voicing like voice your chords properly uh i could have just went from like a flat to f and that that does not give the proper impression i wanted to but when you kind of you move around you rearrange the notes so just being A flat minor to F. It's still A flat minor to F, but it's A flat minor 7 to F 7 9. So the notes are, even though the chord is still far away from each other, you're smoothing out the transition by thinking about what notes you're using and just making it move by a semitone or a whole tone, just keeping it very consistent. I'm just moving up and down it's from G to F. Uh, and that's 
bit of Nixolydian, if you know that if you know your modes, but you can think of that as just two chord, two major chords next to each other in a way where like that that shouldn't really happen in a normal major scale, uh, which is why it hints towards it being Nixolydian, which is you know your normal scale flat seven basic stuff. I did the same move, the same move of just two major chords close to each other, but uh, instead of going from G to F, I just went from B flat to A. That's called sequential modulation, I'm pretty sure, where you take the same movement in between chords, like the same amount of space, but you're just using it on a different set of chords. Uh, and there's the whole voice leading again, right? Because uh, this is technically more of like a B6. Uh, you, could, you could see that as a G minor, but I don't know why you would. Functionally here, but anyway, B flat six to A flat or seven. voice leading if you want to transition in between chords don't think about like the tech you can think about the technical aspects of the chord like where you're going in the scale but some of my best chord modulation sequences are just when you're thinking about the relationships of the notes and not the chords like how close the notes are to each other and how you can move them around the keyboard or the guitar fretboard whatever and actually this method is a lot easier on guitar just because of the nature of the instrument anyway hopefully that didn't go too over anyone's head uh, sorry for the sidetrack but those are all the weird chord movements in the song that aren't just like standard anyway thank you drum trial Is the volume between the mic and the stream still good? I might make a piano vocal cover of that. We're good. All right. So for this stuff, the drop. Main instrument we have coming in here is bit crush sine waves. Uh, the reason they sound like that is they just they have quite a bit of phaser on them okay I do need to explain this oh oh shit logic is doing that thing where plugins don't open up oh well that's not that it's not that important so disperser if you guys are producers uh, I'm sure you use it might not know what it does simplest way I can explain it is it it's like an all pass filter right it, it, it induces phase shifts onto a waveform without changing the amplitude of it. Uh, how can I make that more simple? <sighs> okay, most most like practical basic explanation is it just applies a, a weird transient, like kind of this watery texture to the sound. That's all. That's all you really need to know unless you want to get into the specifics of it. But I'm not your guy to explain it. So that's why it kind of has that like dubstep wub quality. Plus, I believe in the uh, vital patch as well, it did have kind of filter movement there. But, j j you know, just like a standard triangle LFO uh, with the parameter mapped 
to the filter, which was going to A, which is the sine wave, whatever, filter movement. People have been doing that in the genres like this for decades, but this is the main chord stretched out. Uh, this is the automation. Yeah, okay, so there's quite a bit of lossy on it. Obviously, this is just stretch. I say that word way too much. I'm horribly sorry, but this is just the signal pitched up and cut into 16th notes. Um, what is this? More, more sub glitches. I'll get to the method on how I make those later. And that one was background, not very important. What's this? All right. So my method for those, and you'll see them over here too, right? Uh, that generally is taking a something with a lot of texture on it, like a, a drum hit or a dubstep growl, something with a, a lot of data uh, that I can work with. And then adding a plugin called Fracture. Uh, and from there, it's just randomizing parameters. Just, just spamming the randomize button. You can draw in parameters yourself, like draw in automation. That's what most people do. But uh, that's so time consuming. And really the results you get from just pressing the randomize button and resampling that are really worth looking into on their own just the variety of sound you can get and basically what it's doing is it i think it's granulizing pitch shifting uh inverting the phase just all these different effects within one plugin it's called fracture by glitch machines if it would let me open it up but it's it's free so you can grab that and you just get sounds like this from that technique. That was with pitch map. Hold on. That's a good example. Just a lot of weird, weird things. Uh, some of them have pitch map. I think all of them had pitch map applied. Um, and then, of course, the normal post processing rack. That I apply to things. We've just got OTT phaser, which I forgot to tie the back earlier. But the reason I use phaser is it's it's disperser. It's literally just disperser, but I entered in some really specific like I guess numbers from this uh, to this one YouTube tutorial with like less than a thousand views, and it functions in the exact same way. So that's how you kind of get the dubstep like watery. Uh, liquid, like pitch transients at the start. Uh, main thing here also is spectral gate. So without it, it's just this. Very clicky, very textural. Uh, what spectral gate does though is part of that same, the plugin bundle I mentioned earlier. Um, it's like a filter but it reduces things down to their fundamental frequency. If you don't know about the overtone sequence, which I'm sure most people do here, it's, it's just every sound in the universe has, or at least in the one, the one we're aware of, uh, has a fundamental sine wave, just tone, and then a ton of tones above it that raise in a very specific mathematical sequence. But a filter like this, just kind of rounds them all off evenly and conceptually a spectral gate is doing something similar but it's making things a lot more tonal like really helpful for stuff like that yeah Alexander Panos 
It is mud. It is mud pie synthesis. Uh, that was just a run rundown of that technique, which I abuse here throughout most of the song. This this is that same mud pie fra like fracture resampling, but with a preset from Infiltrator by Devious Machines that has a ton of spectral morphing and artifacts after it. So you just kind of get this weird bubbly texture. Uh, and then the rest of it is just the fracture thing. Like all these little clicks and pops. Uh, now where it comes in here. Uh, this is more akin to the stuff I did during the intro where it's just taking pieces of melodic information. Oftentimes, just like random audio files I have on my computer, whether it be like full songs or stuff I've made before or samples, uh, and then pitching them, distorting them, stretching them, and adding pitch map just to have kind of semblance of tonality to it. Without lossy, it's this. What was that? That was definitely something I made in Vital and messed with. Uh, by the way, something when I say something I made in Vital, uh, my process for random Vital bits of harmony like that is generally just wavetables. Just pick, pick a wavetable and don't mess with it. Like maybe some kind of LFO on the actual parameter of like scrolling through the wavetable harmonics themselves, but we're just kind of like making chords and instruments from just random assortments, whether it be like dubstep wavetables or uh, stuff with a lot of overtones so it sounds buzzy. Just th throwing together whatever you can in vital, like the most kind of the most like useless, impractical type of pads ever or leads and then turning them into things like this. Uh, more, more resampling with pitch map and lossy. This same technique I used at the beginning with music box and phase shift. I mean, phase lock. So you have these weird, this weird like gate in between all the notes, and also a bit of pitch warble. Uh. Here. Oh yeah, for these guys. That was just me messing with the guitar, like all the techniques I mentioned before, uh, and adding adding lossy. Definitely a bit of granular. Probably it's something granular though. I would assume. This is a guitar. Now I feel like fraud because I can't even really begin to explain how this one sound was made. I'm sorry, but I do know that this was a guitar. I think it was harmonics and repitching them into a melody and then some bizarre post-processing, maybe chorus. Drums are pretty simple. Uh, I could have mixed this kick better. That was way too cursory. But... Here. That's a clap with comb filtering, lossy fade out, and then I think phase lock. A couple foley loops added together. Couple claps added together. Most of them aren't even in time. There's just a couple big accents. Uh, 
and then there's a reverse kick. Uh, it's the same thing as this kick. I think just EQ'd slightly differently, took out a lot of the mids. Okay, the, the kicks here get really weird. Sorry about my voice if you weren't here for the beginning of the stream. I said I had allergies, but yeah. This is horrible. This is everything that is wrong with the world. Uh, I don't have any excuse for this. I'm sorry. I will pay you in reparations for the trauma you've seen. 14 decibel boost here around 50 hertz. I think my excuse for that is because I just really wanted this section to clip and that was the only way of achieving it because it was kind of a bad kick to start with. The drums are so simple. Although what I did do quite a bit was I like, I stretched and repitched the kick itself. Like turn it into a, a fill almost. Uh, this clap is very bizarre. I've got overdrive, stereo, to a Haas effect, so it's kind of wide. Space designer, just for a bit of like, oh, that's not even on. Vast reverb, just standard stuff. A little altar boy, I think, to shift the formant of the clap down, kind of like skew the transient a bit. Uh, and overdrive, I probably already said that, the standard stuff. But the weird thing is phase lock. Like, because of that, it has almost no attack. It, it fades in, uh, which is just something that phase lock will do. Like, that's without. It almost sounds just like a, like scraping. And then with it, it's like the transient gets delayed almost. It kind of fades into itself. Uh, and that's just what happens when you shift the phase of a signal a ton, which is what that plugin is doing. It'll skew the start of it. I will get to this later. I haven't, I haven't even finished this section. All right, what's over here? Ah, those guys. Those are pretty cool. Okay. So, this is going to, you're going to see this a lot, uh, OSOTK Drum Loop 4. The basis for this song was a drum loop. Like, I, the basis for all, all of these, um, all these bits of sound design, I mean, were literally, it was literally just a drum loop I took, uh, added randomization on the tempo, uh, pitch map. Stretched it, pitched it up, and then applied some weird post processing. But the main thing, this is a technique I like to use a lot, is frequency shifting before pitch map. Because, okay, so like, uh, pitch shifting itself works by multiplying the harmonics of a sound up in accordance to the harmonic series so it can properly transpose it. Frequency shifting multiplies everything equally. So that's why you end up with atonal sounds if you pitch them up too much or too low. Like they'll kind of lose their melodic or harmonic characteristics and just become noise. Um, and, and when I put that before pitch map, so when pitch map was giving the sound, like it was giving the signal a chord to assign to it, uh, the like frequency shifting beforehand was kind of interfering and like shifting the fundamental around like this is what it was doing it was moving the fundamental around so when it gave the signal a chord it had to constantly readjust itself and then i got these strange bits of harmonic data from pitch map and used that sample so much throughout this piece but this is one of those things with the phase lock on it. Like I said before, pitch warble and this kind of 16th note gate. Yeah, that was 
that's what I'm talking about. Like, that's the frequency shift going down. It's very hard to articulate properly. I probably... Sounds like I'm just saying nonsense. But... At least auditorily, it should make sense. Or conceptually. What was this? Same thing. Resampling bits of chords. Okay. That... Should... This is a music box manipulated. I definitely have frequency shifting on that to bring it upwards. And then when I cho I chopped it up into 16th notes, or was that triplets? I think, six yeah, 16th triplets and had like the first two up 12 semitones and then the rest of them were normal. Uh, this is the sub glitch I use quite a lot throughout the whole thing. What is this? All right, we're gonna un unmask this real quick and take off lossy. Wow, I don't know I made that. Yeah, so this just looks like something I got from throwing an amen break into infiltrator by devious machines uh probably pitched it down maybe filtering automation to give it a bit of that like wub like characteristic but it's a limiter so it's not clipping the whole song and this is something i do so much with eq uh sorry with, with uh reverb and it's probably one of the things one, one of the most like actionable things you can take from this if you're going to start doing it on your DAW now is take a reverb raise it raise the wet all the way and then lower the size to like 10 just as low as it can possibly go so then you you get the effect of it playing in like a steel chamber or like a cellar or something weird uh that's just the you want an impulse response with already a bit of spaciousness, but you can do that, yeah. It's limiter, and then the lossy, so it's just a background thing. Um, you know, lossy lowers the sample rate of a sound, makes it lower quality, and that kind of subsequently just takes away high end. Uh, and that's what I use a lot for when I make, when I make something that's worth using but not worth being in the foreground i'll just throw something like lossy on it so it's just a detail yeah it was this guy so this was resampling the amen break from infiltrator with pitch map and then distortion and i, I just got so lucky got weird stuff Infiltrator by Devious Machines. Good plugin. There was definitely some weird repitching frequency shifting stuff before I resampled those. Similar. Just this section. Really fun. Anyway. This is. What is this? Yeah, that's easy. That is a vine boom. Yeah. Uh, pitched up 32 semitones in polyphonic mode, I believe. And from there, just pitch mapped it. But when you stretch something and pitch it up 32 semitones, you just... You get like every... Okay, remember when I mentioned anti-aliasing when you get a frequency that is too far beyond what your DAW can handle so it encodes it back down? That's what you get when you pitch something up 32 semitones. Like all the high end maps back down to low end, but it's not... It doesn't register it in the way it should be because you're just pitching it up way too far for like your audio unit to process. So you just get these weird artifacts. 
Uh, there's the amen break again. I think that's part of the amen resampling. This is too. Whatever this is. Oh, this was cool. Yeah, so I, I took it. No, okay. Yeah, this is the vine boom. I took the vine boom and... If you're wondering where I get so, why I have so many weird samples, oftentimes I'll just be on a call with my friends or something and just ask them for a sample. and They'll send me the most just asinine, like, garbage ever. But, you know, I, I love it because I turn it into things like this. But it was the Vine Boom stretched, distorted, pitch mapped, yada yada. But I threw it into a granulizer and did that same trick where... I lower the gr I scroll through the position parameter in automation, but I automate the grain length down and raise the grain size or vice versa. And then you get the tremolo effect where the second half of the audio starts to kind of stretch because the actual, like the distance in between the grains lowers, but the distance that the grain has itself intrinsically raises. Which you can barely even tell because of the lossy automation, but yeah. Let's see. There's that again. Uh, everything else in that section is just resampling those bits of audio, most likely. And I think we've covered covered quite a bit of it so now we get to the color base part just a bit of a milestone you guys can ask questions if you want I'll go ahead and check someone oh oh Negus hi Bro, why are you a piano tutorial channel? Long story. Won't be like that for long. Drama Charles says, I have no questions. Okay, yeah, I'll just ask for questions at the end. My bad. Although, question, um, this song, I would say, took from spring break in May. So, like, one, like, two weeks, maybe one week, where this was all I did. Took a bit of a break and then got back into it in April. So, I would say, in total, maybe a month and a half. Anyway. Um, okay, this part, right, so, I made, I made the entirety of this section just in, like, complete, like, ADHD, uh, near seizure mode, because I had, like, the entire I watched like the entirety of season one and two of don't hug me I'm scared in the background while I made this and it was like 6 a.m but yeah okay so this is a very this is a really specific tr trick I would use with um infiltrator I'd use this preset that turned th it cut out the high end of a lot of things and made it very transient, uh, focused. And then I would like lower it, lower the pitch and just get these really strange sub artifacts. Yeah, this is, this is a good example. Kind of reused them. What's this guy? Yeah. This was somatic sound. That was the same technique. I think it just had like spectral gate applied at the start. So it kind of had that weird like higher note attached to it. All right, I do not even know where to start with this. But 
we're gonna go ahead. So this is a hand pan. Uh, I believe by Ample, uh, same same company that made Ample guitar, Ample bass, uh, did a hand pan for a while back in like I think the early 2010s. The the GY is so like <laughs> vintage, but it sounds beautiful. And then I distorted, compressed, limited, and did the same trick with reverb. Just squashed it to hell and back. Pitched it down. I think I pitched it down in MIDI because when you pitch things down in audio, they uh, just the nature of pitching things down themselves, like the algorithms that DAW uses, you'll like lose a bit of high end or gain high end if you pitch things up. It like the sound, the sound won't sound. The signal won't be processed in the way you want. Like it'll just add this kind of artifact where the quality is lowered. And sometimes that can be ideal, but generally if I want things to not have that effect, you just do it in MIDI beforehand. All right. This is obviously just glitching. Okay. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, so this could have been achieved by a really fast tremolo with the rate automating downwards, but I did it by hand. Yeah. It's not even noticeable because of how much is being smeared by the OTT and limiting, but whatever. I think this section is pitched up. I repitched some of the notes. Uh, not even just like by but not even just by octave but like to different notes within the scale so they were very disconnected from the rest of the chord like you notice how you can hear the tail of the notes played before within these but for here they're independent and then it comes back uh, that's just glitching it okay stuttering, t you know, taking the same piece of audio and repeating it a ton of times. Okay, remember that drum loop I was talking about earlier with the uh, post-process, with a uh, post-processing a uh, stretched and repitched drum loop uh, with frequency shifting automation and pitch map. This is what I got from it. That was pretty sick. Yeah, and that's that just all all the textures and bits of movement just results from I think it was having like tempo automation uh on the drum loop. This is a tail from it, I'm pretty sure, resampled with a tremolo. It sounds really low quality, but I guess it worked in context, especially with the post processing. This is. Oh, this was so weird. Okay. This piece. That is the GUI select from Pokemon, uh, but with stretched repitch with bit crush automation. That's something I don't do often. It, it had a, the sample rate, I believe, going downwards uh, and then wasn't phase lock with spectral gate. Yeah. So that's used quite a bit for accents. Is it pitched down? This. This is the a cappella to I Love You by Billie Eilish. Uh, with that preset from Infiltrator over it and then granulized. 
<laughs> or is it fading in with phase lock? Here's some... I believe that was a drum hit uh, with this plugin called Crush, I think. Hold on. Uh, FK, FK, Influx. It was either FK, FK, Influx or... Let me find it. This other one that I got earlier or a crush by tritic that's a distortion plugin with a lot of cool presets just scroll through that and it's uh, more focused on like bit, bit crushing type stuff like it's not warm saturation it just completely destroys the sound but you can get some crazy artifacts from it and use them for fills or whatnot <laughs> So this is that same drum fill. No post processing. And with post processing. It's nothing special, really. It's just kind of a transient from that glitchy resample drum fill, but what's making it is the space designer with the technique I said before, big reverb, wet all the way up, but size obscenely low. Okay, this is, I think, a resampled culmination of one of the sounds here, but up, I, I would assume, around 27 semitones with the uh, spectral preset from F glitch machines no infiltrator by devious machines god dude plug-in names <laughs> there's so many to keep track of and then i think this was manually laying out like a piece from here after pitch map and kind of arranging it into this pattern that slows down uh, and it did have spectral gate automation on it. Uh, okay, I'm so sorry, but this is one of the, this waveform is one of the things where I can't even begin to explain what happened. These are the hi hats. Probably not even noticeable to most people. <laughs> This is a neuro bass from Vital. Uh, generally, my techniques for neuro basses, my, my technique for neuro bass stays pretty much the same. It's the same thing with like a dubstep basses, DMV basses, anything similar to that. You just take a sine wave or saw wave, FM them to each other. You, you can use more complicated waveforms, but especially for just growl basses like this, you don't really need to. FM them to each other up quite a bit of distortion and the main thing is like filter movement uh i bounced it down to audio so unfortunately i can't show you what i was doing but i had a several notch filters like this pretty lowered pretty far i would say with like a 0.75 bell curve maybe uh down to negative 24 db and i would just like scroll it through the eq here uh, there was like three of them going, but then it gets kind of the uh, textural movement and pitch as well. And the reason it's getting that tremolo slowdown effect is because of, I should have mentioned that before, but that's a function logic has very speed where you can just slow down a audio file and it'll lower the pitch and speed at the same time. So without it, it's just that, but with it, you get this. Just an in, more, more of like an interesting way to, to end waveforms than a fade out. Obviously not, not applicable all the time, but this is useful. And you can get that same effect in other, other DAWs with, I would assume, something like Grossbeat, Ableton. 
I most definitely has something akin to that feature. This was the same. That was that same distortion plugin. I think this was this was a piece of percussion, but I just used that crush by Tritic. And then I think I arrange different pieces and pitch them up into this kind of pattern to get this really quick textural fill in between things. You can hear it in this Vincent's. This is something I resampled into a rim shot. Just background detail, not that interesting. This is cool though. This is cool. This is Rush Ram. Uh, if you don't play Pokemon, that sounded like gibberish. It is one of the legendaries from Pokemon Black and White. Uh, it's Cry Audio File with OTT, okay, Magic Switch, which is a chorus plugin, and Filter Movement. Just Filter Movement. Like. Yeah, with it, this it's thing is just absurdly stretched to a point where it's mostly just sub and then a high note. I was really inspired by uh, the work of Bo on SoundCloud, if you know him. He has this one track called Stumbling, and it's a genius use of like filter movement on basic waveforms, and just how you, you can make even the most simple synths really like wide with chorus and then in intriguing with filter movement but that's fracture resampling i can tell you know if you weren't here for that that's just taking the plug in fracture and spamming the randomize button and letting it randomly granulize repitch stretch uh, pieces of audio into something new. Oh, and uh, as for what I'm applying for post-processing on all these tracks, I don't think there's anything actually on the bus which was ill-advised in foresight and in hindsight, but like, it's just OTT generally around, I would say, 100%. And when you're working with digital sounds like that, it's more forgiving. But distortion, uh, we don't we don't want any dynamics whatsoever most of the time. Um, sample delay, which is a Haas effect. If you don't know, that's just taking an audio file and playing it on another channel just a couple milliseconds after itself, which gives kind of the false impression of it being stereo. So just a w quick way to like widen sounds and funny thing that's actually how headphones work like headphones as far as I know are not in stereo they just utilize that Haas effect to play the waveform slightly after itself on another channel tricks your brain because of the way we perceive sounds stereoscopically but anyway I think that's really about it for this section I think we have this part here that's okay yeah nothing really interesting except maybe this which is a reef I have from Christmas that I just use as percussion sometimes uh, this part this waveform is cool though I th I think it was, was it Isotope with Ven Audio? Okay, Valhalla, DSP, LSE. Yeah, so they have a couple free plugins. Most people know them for like Vintage Verb, but Frequency Echo is one of the ones they have. And if you like automate the shift going downwards, it's really cool. It gets that kind of tremolo effect but it's baked into the waveform so you have almost like a separate you have almost like a separate track of the signal layered over it with the effect and it's also 
lowering in pitch, can, like at the same time. Was that it or was it this one? That's the one, yeah. And you notice, you notice that? Just a bit of filter movement from that effect, but anyway, good, good plugin. Uh, Valhalla frequency echo. One of those sub glitches I mentioned earlier, and those sub glitches just kind of brought back and then the fracture resampling with page map composes most of like this part plus the guitars they just kind of come in intermittently okay last last bit of really compelling sound design before the punk outro is this right here If it'll play. Yeah. So, step by step. Good lord, what is this? Okay, so this was a percussion loop thrown into Quanta, uh, granulized. And I would say, I would say frequency shifted, uh, and then pitch map applied afterwards. <laughs> And then, you know, the spectral gate, adding quite a bit of the artifacts there. That was the, that was the percussion loop. Uh, yeah, it was, it was being granulized, so the pitch was being randomized, and the grain size was being randomized. There was just a lot of texture and transients for pitch map to work with. This... I'm s almost certain was a preset from Devious Machines Infiltrator. Yeah, it was one. It was just one of like the filter movement ones, but applied to that same signal. Uh, saw wave, triangle wave in v v with distortion on vital. Raising in pitch, and then having uh, tremolo there. No, not tremolo, sorry, vibrato. Those are my vocals thrown into that same uh, Quanta preset, or preset I made. That's something I use quite a lot, especially in my earlier productions, uh, was just the chorus vocals granulized into this weird sea of noise. But you have that coming in between the drums and the guitars, which are stuttering. You know. with everything else. Yeah. From there, it's just the punk outro. I, I showed you the vocals earlier. I showed everyone the guitars. Uh, oh yeah. I use Addictive Drums 2 for percussion. As far as my post-processing my post on that, it's really just taking 
away a bit of 6K to make room for the vocals and guitars up on like the higher register. Uh, overdrive and individually, this has got OTT, the body, everything else is really, really just a mix of OTT saturation, maybe EQ. Uh, the body though has the envelope, which is lowering the attack because I felt like it was too sharp. Uh, there's got to be some way to get this to play. I could freeze it and play it all the way through, but like we're here for the breakdown, so. Got the bass, bass coming in. It's really just an amplitude preset, the same pr amp I mentioned earlier. Plug in. Really nice sounding. OTT, of course, and a limiter because just to take away the out, just to lower the output level because it was clipping. But. Okay, okay, yeah, the one more important piece of information from like my like processing instruments is these guitars during the power chord rock section are absolutely just destroyed with limiting. Because I... I just did not want there to be any dynamics whatsoever. Uh, EQ, that's taking away a huge chunk of around like upper 3k to make room for the vocal sibilance because if it didn't have that it would just be like noise cuts a lot of that out the guitar buzz and the vocals fade out with lossy which fit really well um i guess there's a couple other random things like here this is my good friend Java Colby. I don't know if he's still in the stream. Hello, if you are. But he was kind enough to take the that like little guitar interlude section of Laurel. I sent it to him when I was like working on it one day and he ran it through emitter in Ableton and I just added some post processing and got these interesting pieces. It'll play. Just give it a second. Yeah. And these come in throughout the whole piece. There's spectral gate automation on those. But yeah, you can notice them here. I covered that piano earlier. Just a just a normal claustrophobic piano uh, with the whole little author boy trick of pitching it up 12 piano and strings a lot of people are going to ask earlier a lot are going to ask but if you weren't here earlier contact Stradivari cello and violin and other than that I think we're done anything else was really insignificant or not worth showing and Okay, I guess one more thing was the uh, the bass here. So we have just the standard, the, during the electronic section, we have like the standard sub. Just vital white noise, uh, saturation on a sine wave, whatever. But the actual 808 was this. That's just a normal ass 808 sample I took, but... It's got chorus, the fast reverb trick, overdrive, more chorus, and then EQ taking out a bit of a resonance around 230. But that just gives you this really strange texture. It's reminiscent a bit of what Dil of Dylan Brady's production on the first 100 Gex LP just putting putting reverb on a bass I, I i enjoy it because it's almost like a uh, 
testament to just pushing the boundaries of music and just being like uh, really experimental because up until recently producers haven't even thought of I mean like that that just hasn't been something people have considered things like that and that was I mean obviously there was probably a couple people pioneering it beforehand but that was the whole goal with Laurel. I just wanted something that no one else had really done before. And I didn't think of this. Like, this was so hugely inspired by, like, everyone else's contribution to the scene. Uh, like, I guess I'm, gonna, I'm not really going to name drop. I mean, maybe I should. I don't know. But we got, like, underscores just with the signature post-punk type of outros. Alexander Panos with this sort of stuff over here. And, you know, a lot of a lot of artists. Wish Lane, Drama Trial, uh, like, least favorite. Everyone is kind of been leaning more towards folk. So I figured I'd capitalize on that and make something more, I guess, not necessarily in-depth because that sounds pretentious, but I wanted to take all of the pieces of inspiration that were like floating around the whole cultural zeitgeist of the this post hyper pop place we've ended up in as a community and bring everything together in a way that no one had really heard before so this is not original i cannot say this is original because of how sheerly it was just formed out of studying other people's music but I guess I have the scene to thank for that. And thank you guys for coming to the breakdown. So if I'll take any questions, I guess, right now. Was that how I master vocals? Vocals, really minimal. I guess it was just OTT, uh, a, bit of, a bit of EQ, but... That's pretty much it. I think if you have a good source for your recording, you don't need something really over the top. DSing and applying more surgical EQ cuts and boosts does work if you want a more professional sound, like a comprehensive approach to it. But for a song like this, I just figured it wasn't really needed. All right, well, I I guess that's it, unless you guys have anything really pressing that, like, I didn't cover or you'd like to see again. Sorry for making this so drawn out. I wanted to fully explain every piece, but thank you for stopping by, everyone. Yeah, no problem. Sleep portrait. Hopefully people can get like inspired or understand a bit more of the technical aspects but but that was the goal all right well the vod, the VOD is going to stay up thank you everyone for coming i won't keep you any longer have a good day no zeisim i'm not going to meow but thank you no problem, guys.